I'm here to introduce our next speaker, Frank Albert from the University of Minnesota. Frank works on complex trait genetics, uh, uncovering how genetic variation creates heritable uh, phenotypic variation. And much of Frank's work focuses on regulatory variation. These are DNA sequence differences that influence gene expression. Uh, and Frank and his team have developed a number of creative approaches that have revealed important principles uh, about regulatory variation. Uh, and in particular, Frank has shown that genetic influences on protein versus mRNA abundance are highly discrepant. And more recently, um, he's developed new approaches that are characterizing the mechanisms that account for these discrepancies. So, Frank? All right. Thanks very much, Melon, and uh, thanks for the person to the person running the computer for unblurring my slides. That's, that's really uh, that was disturbing. Uh, this is much better. So, so thanks very much, Melon, for the kind introduction. Thanks, Nikolai, for the for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Um, Melon will actually reappear later in this talk uh, for reasons that will become uh, clear then. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll start by saying that my role at this meeting uh, really has been that of a, a lingering admirer of, of single cell mass uh, spectrometry based proteomics. My lab currently doesn't use it. Um, but, you know, given the advances that I've that I've been hearing about, maybe we will in the near future. So thanks again for having me. Uh, so what I'll do today is really give sort of a whirlwind overview of, of a couple of things that my lab has been working on, um, specifically focused on genetic variation, protein abundance and, and degradation. And the overall theme for the lab um, is that we're really fascinated with natural genetic variation, every trait that you can imagine and measure and, and see and observe in the world uh, around you uh, differs among individuals in the species. And just by way of illustration, here is the latest uh, overview of human genome-wide association study results from two days ago. You're looking at the human chromosomes here, uh, and then each dot is an association between a genetic variant, a, a DNA difference between human individuals that is associated with a given trait of interest. And then different traits are colored uh, in, different, in different colors here. So the message, of course, is that there's you know, extremely many of them, thousands of associations for thousands of traits have been, uh, have been found over the years. So, so there's, there's a lot there um, for people to look at. And a, a big common theme from this is that the vast majority of these associations uh, probably affect phenotypes by changing gene expression. There's many ways this has been looked at over the years. Uh, here's a way I like to show this. We're breaking down the genome by protein coding regions uh, and then various uh, intergenic uh, enhancers, promoters, UTRs. Um, and you see, and we, we ask what fraction of genetic variation comes from uh, DNA differences in those regions. And of course, the vast majority comes from variation in enhancers and promoters and, and things like that. So gene expression is very important for, um, for complex traits. Um, and that's what my lab studies and the whole talk will be in the scheme. So I really wanna make sure we're absolutely on the same page here. So we have a population of individuals, let's say humans for now. Uh, and then there is an allele in this population where let's say this red allele here uh, increases the RNA abundance of a given gene of interest that should one might think then give us extra protein for this gene as well. And it's something about this protein abundance difference that then ends up influencing um, a trait that we care about in one way um, or the other. Um, so it turns out that the vast majority of work in this field, uh, because of convenience, I would argue, is um, actually looking at, well, I just gave it away, okay, uh, looking at RNA abundance. Uh, it's still true today that something like 90, 95% of studies in this field measure RNA and do not measure proteins. So our knowledge about how proteins are genetically influenced is much poorer. Um, a reason for that is, or the reason for that is technological because there's really two things that have to be true if we wanna uh, do genetic variation, protein abundance, we really do need large sample sizes, right? So, so, so 10 individuals, even 100 individuals, I would say these days just isn't really enough to, to see anything that's sort of beyond just the tip of the iceberg. And of course, well, then we also need genetically variable individuals. And certainly until at least a few years ago, just sort of you know doing these kinds of things in, in, in hundreds, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of individuals with mass spectrometry, I don't think was really feasible. 
Um, so because of that, we've been finding uh, what we think are creative ways of sort of working around these limitations. And that's what you will hear uh, from me today in, in three themes. We'll be hearing about our work in protein abundance. Then we'll be looking at discrepancies between RNA and protein abundance and their genetic influences. And then we, we will be looking at very recent unpublished work in protein uh, degradation. Um, the system we'll be using throughout this whole talk is the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae, this wonderful single cell fungus that shares a lot of biology with us. Um, and we have at our disposal amazing tools and tricks we can use to dissect genetic variation. Um, and all the work will be in these two strains. We're comparing this lab strain, this reference strain BY, to this vineyard strain uh, called RM. And these two individuals are genetically different. There's a DNA difference every 200 bases or so, which in this metric actually makes them five times more different than two typical humans would be from each other. So quite a bit of differences for us to dissect. And now for protein uh, abundance and at the risk of getting run out of the room and thrown out of the conference, uh, we're for now <laughs> going to use GFP tags uh, to measure protein abundance. Uh, in yeast, there's a collection of strains of 4,000 strains that each, uh, where each strain carries one gene already genetically tagged with GFP. And it's, of course, great for uh, looking at variation between cells, among cells, in terms of how much uh, they're making of that given protein. Um, so in terms of genetic mapping, what we do is we take our two strains and we cross them. We then get this diploid hybrid. We sporulate that. And then we get these populations of meiotic recombinants, where every cell then carries a random combination of the two parental alleles. They're haploid. Yeast can be both haploid and, and diploid. So it's not strictly an F2 cross, but it's certainly sort of this one round of uh, meiotic recombination that we're doing. Um, and now, importantly, we're not picking out these individuals and putting them in a 96 well plate, let's say. We're keeping them as a pool, right? So then a single tube of these recombinants will carry millions of these recombined, each genetically unique um, individuals. And that's where the large statistical power comes from that we need to do uh, genetics in these kinds of systems. Uh, so we then take our population that all carry the GFP tag and run them through a cell sorter. We get a distribution like this. Uh, and now comes the key part, and this kind of method will be shared for everything in the talk today. So I'm going to spend a little more time on it now and then go, go much faster for, for the rest of it. Uh, the method we're using is based on bulk segregant analysis, where we're taking extreme individuals, so let's say uh, individuals that have the 1% highest or 1% lowest GFP abundance, and we're using uh, uh, facts to collect 10,000, 20,000 cells or so off these individuals. And to get that many cells at this, 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 this high, highly stringent selection, you need to be looking at hundreds of thousands of millions of cells, and that's ultimately where high statistical power comes from uh, in the system. Now you have your two populations, high and low, and then we just sequence those whole genome and we look at data that, that ends up looking like this. So here's the yeast genome with its chromosomes. And here we're looking at the difference in allele frequency of the lab versus the wine allele in the high versus the low population, right? So on average, there's no difference between these populations, but there are these sites where we have so these deflections where uh, let's say the wine allele here was greatly enriched in, in, the, in the high GFP population, suggesting that there's some DNA variation here that sort of pushes cells uh, into, that, into that population. So these are, these are the kinds of things we're after. Um, we're actually more formally identifying these peaks uh, by turning them into uh, more conventional measures of significance. Uh, and when we do this, we then get for this single protein, uh, nine loci that are flagged as statistically significant at a 5% false discovery rate as affecting its abundance. Another really important thing to, to take note of here, because that will also be shared throughout the rest of this talk, is that the, the GFP tag gene, its location in the genome in this case, is here on, on chromosome 12, right? And what you'll appreciate is that all of these loci are actually on different chromosomes from the tag gene. So we're not looking at DNA variation at the gene itself. We're not looking at its promoter or its, its own um, uh, protein sequence, but we're looking at transacting variation, right? So what this is, is that you have some kind of regulator, a transcription factor, a signaling molecule, a receptor of various kinds that then carries this genetic de de variation and then that uh, through different activity or abundance of this factor ends up affecting the, the gene or the trait that you're interested in uh, in, in trans. 
Um, so, and that again will be true for, for everything that uh, we'll be seeing today. So uh, this single protein then was influenced by nine of these transacting loci, and that was not atypical. So at the time we were doing the study with 160 genes, we got about 1,000 loci. Um, and here is the distribution of number of loci per, per gene. And we saw that the typical genes of the median gene is affected by, uh, by six loci, all of which are transacting. And at the time, the study is now is quite a few years old now, but you see that so that was a greatly incre increased uh, number of loci we were able to see compared to studies um, of much smaller panels um, at the time. Um, so uh, this is where these loci are in the genome. So we're looking at this is the position of the gene uh, that is tagged in the genome on, uh, along these chromosomes. And this is the position of the loci that influence them. Uh, so you see there's, there's, there's quite a lot going on. Um, the thing I'd like you to see is are these positions here where a single region of the genome influences the abundance of, of many proteins, right? So we have these transacting hotspots which we can visualize in this way by just going through and, and putting, putting the peaks into bins. And we again see, see these hotspot positions. I'm gonna draw your attention to, to these three in particular. Uh, these are the genes that cause these that were identified by others before. These are highly pleiotropic regulators that influence, well, obviously the expression of, of uh, dozens of proteins. We also know the, they affect um, the abundance of hundreds up to thousands of RNAs and growth in a variety of different conditions, right? So the idea is that what we're seeing here is we have really have sort of these um, disturbances of cell state that then are reflected in all kinds of uh, phenotypic outcomes, including protein abundance. So keep those in mind because we're seeing, we'll be seeing those three uh, in particular again later. So that was the summary of the first part. This is how we've been looking at protein abundance, right? And our results were um, that we find this great complexity in how individual proteins are affected genetically uh, from variation all across the genome uh, in trans, and uh, we have these highly pleiotropic um, loci. Okay, so, so that was protein abundance. And of course, um, given a lot of attention in the field has been on RNA, we were then interested in this sort of specific relationship between RNA and protein abundance. Uh, the way this is done, so just by quick recap, um, usually the, the way this is done, so people measure RNA by RNA sequencing, let's say a microarray, and they do mapping in a standard panel. And for a given gene, you might get these two loci here. And then you, do, you take the same individuals, hopefully, and then you later do a mass spectrometry or something else, and you get these protein loci. And then you pile them up like this, and you see here's a locus that's the same, and here's two protein-specific loci, and this RNA locus didn't, didn't really, isn't seen at the protein level. And depending which comparison you do, which studies you compare, you end up with something around 50%, let's say, on average of these locus-level discrepancies. Um, so, so, but there is a problem with sort of this way of looking at things and because it's all based on just comparing across studies, right? So, so today I might be doing an RNA study and then next year you will be doing your protein study um, and, and then we're comparing that. So you have perfect compound, confounding of RNA protein um, with, uh, you know, the lab, the technique, uh, the people that do it, uh, and even different genetic mapping designs. So, so that's sort of, that's not good because gene expression and in particular trans acting effects on gene expression are quite sensitive to the environment. So ideally, what you'd want is you'd want to measure the relevant quantities at the same time, right? So in this case, RNA and protein, same time in the same cells. And again, with this constraint that it has to be a lot of cells for statistical power. Um, so this was a challenge that at the time Christian Briand, um, a really great postdoc um, in the lab, um, set himself to tackle. And here's what he came up with, um, with this uh, CRISPR-based reporter system that works like this. So for protein abundance, it's still GFP. But now for RNA, uh, the, the, the trick is this. So he adds this, uh, this tag here where we have a guide RNA um, that is flanked by two ribozymes such that upon uh, transcription of or creation of this, of this messenger RNA, uh, the guide RNA will cleave itself out um, of the message and it, then, it will then find a deactivated Cas9 protein that in turn is fused to a transcriptional activator and guided to a reporter gene that we put into these cells um, that is just and cherry, so red fluorescence, uh, and will then drive it, right? Um, so the idea is that Green is protein, and in the same cell, red is a measure of at least RNA production uh, for, the same, for the same gene. 
Um, there's, there was a lot of validation. Christian did at the time here is sort of one way of looking at that. So he was uh, engineering strains where we can uh, control the abundance of a given gene by putting estradiol in the, in the medium. Um, and this is what these numbers are, estradiol concentrations. And we're doing qPCR of that gene and comparing that to M-cherry fluorescence. And you're seeing that, so we, we, we get this monotone increase of more M-cherry with more mRNA. I, I do know it's not linear, it does plateau, um, and it, is, it, is, it, it doesn't work with every gene. Some genes you tap out at the top, others you're not sensitive enough, but it's, if I remember correctly, about a third of the genes in the genome that we think should, should, should work with this and have this monotonic uh, relationship. And ultimately, that's all we need to then do basically what I showed you before, right? We do the same cross, we make our meiotic uh, large populations, we put them in the fax machine, um, and we draw our sort gates. Only this time, we're sorting on high versus low M cherry um, and sequence and get our traces. Uh, and then this is all in trans again. And then for protein, we take the same populations at the same time we're at the sorter and just drawing our gates the way I already showed you um, and doing and getting our traces. And then we can put these traces on top of each other, right, and compare. So in this case, um, what we get then is two loci where we have consistent um, influences on RNA and protein um, of, of, of the, from the same gene. We have two uh, what looks like RNA-specific loci, and we have six loci where we have protein signal but not RNA signal according to our system. Um, this is for one gene. Christian then repeated this uh, for a total of 10 genes at the time, which gave us a total of, believe it or not, exactly 100 loci <laughs> at this uh, false discovery rate of 7%. Um, and uh, the example I showed you was not unusual. It's a minority of loci where we detect both RNA and protein in the same direction. Um, we detect a small majority, actually, of these loci only in uh, for proteins. So. To the best of our ability, it really looks like there are these protein-specific effects um, on uh, protein-specific effects of genetic variation on protein abundance that you that you can see at the at the RNA um, level. So the question now, of course, becomes where do those come from? And we heard we heard yesterday um, uh, about about this topic already um, from Megan and Saad. Um, so. There's two possibilities, right? Um, oh, okay, and I should say, this is where Malon enters the scene again. So, um, so Malon actually was a postdoc in my lab until earlier this year. And believe it or not, so Nikolai invited me to present here at the end of December, I would say. And a week later, Malon applied for a job at, at PSI. And I, I read his work completely independently. <laughs> I, did, I did not tip Malon off to this great opportunity. Um, so uh, an amazing, an amazing coincidence because the rest of the of the work that I'll be showing you was entirely done um, by 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 Malon. All right. So Malon was interested in in how can these you know how can these protein specific effects arise. Two possibilities: RNA production, uh, sorry, protein production, protein destruction. Um, we had shown earlier, we and others, uh, we and yeast, others in human cells, that it, it, it's unlikely to be translation. So that leaves degradation. Uh, but it turns out this 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 had never been been mapped genetically, just because people weren't aware or didn't have tools to to really do that in enough samples. Um, Malon fixed this by, by recognizing that there are these cool reporter systems called tandem fluorescent timers, or TFTs, which are a fusion of two fluorophores, green and red. And it turns out they were developed in the Knob lab at the University of Heidelberg. And it turns out that uh, GFP, green color, matures and folds quickly, such that a young protein will already be uh, green. And it takes more time for the red to mature and fold so that only older protein molecules will then, um, will then show both colors. What this means then is if you're in a cell that has high degradation, fast degradation of this reporter, that cell will already be green, but you're not seeing much red yet. Whereas if you're in a cell that slowly degrades the reporter, you have more of an even ratio. And indeed, when we look at single cell populations, this is, this is something we can see. So there's this widespread in red indicative of differences in, in protein degradation among these single cells. And you can um, 
okay, I, sh I should back up and say, so Malon published two really nice papers using these kinds of reporters to map variation in the ubiquitin proteasome system, which I'm not really going into other than say that he found uh, causal genes um, all over the, the UPS uh, with various functions. Almost all of them had multiple causal DNA variants. Uh, feel free to ask me about that later. It's, it's really a lot of cool stuff going on, including a proteasome component. Um, but I'm going to focus then now on, on unpublished work that, that Malon sort of gifted to us uh, as, as he was uh, going to his, to his new job and that, that we're currently then analyzing and, and hoping to wrap up the story on, on this soon. Where he tagged then, uh, what I'm going to show you is data from 49 individual proteins that were tagged with these, um, with these reporter systems. You can guess what, what we then did, what Malon did. You know, we make our cells, we draw our gates, sort gates. Um, in this case, we're sorting on the ratio of red to green. So we're collecting cells with uh, very fast or very slow degradation. We sequence and we get uh, we get our, um, our Q2L traces. Here's an example for the degradation of this, of this protein here. Um, Melon did two biological replicates, so independent replicates uh, for everything that I'm going to show you. We tend to have pretty good agreement here between these replicates, and here's our significance uh, profiles. And we're, we're seeing that this individual protein is affected by eight, by eight loci across the genome, um, influencing its, its degradation now. Um, again, that's not atypical across these 49 proteins for which we have data. We have a total of 200 loci. Uh, the median loci affecting them is five, again, quite a bit of genetic complexity. All of this is transacting, nearly all of this, I, sh I should say. Um, this is where these loci are. Um, you see that they also tend to pile up at these, uh, at these uh, hotspot looking positions, uh, which we can look at in this heat, heat map, sorry, not heat map, histogram style <laughs> uh, plot of the genome. And if I'm now gonna overlay um, a couple of marker or genes that we know to be causal, this is what we're getting, right? So in orange, we have our three pleiotropic regulators that I showed you um, earlier. And you, we can see that a lot of the proteins have their degradation influenced by these loci. What we think is going on here, that these are quite indirect effects, right? So because these, these genes have nothing to do sort of specifically with protein degradation. There's a transcription factor, an RNA binding protein and, and a signaling molecule, a signaling protein. Um, and uh, so again, these, these change cell state and among the many consequences, we see uh, the degradation of many proteins being altered by these positions. And of course, over here, we have these uh, causal genes that Malon earlier identified as affecting the activity of the ubiquitin proteasome system per se. And uh, we also see that some of them, certainly here at UBC6 and at RPT6, we have um, proteins who seem to have their degradation affected by, by, these, by these core UPS components, presumably in a quite direct manner then. Um, okay, so just to, to, uh, to, to finish uh, that part, in a, bit, in a bit like Christian, right? Of course, we were then also interested, well, okay, that's degradation. What, what does that do to protein abundance? Uh, to the genetics of protein abundance of these same uh, of these same proteins. So same trick, right? Same cell, same population as before. We can either sort and gate on the ratio of the two colors to look at degradation, or just look at GFP, and that gives us a measure of protein abundance. Um, so Melon also did that for all of these proteins, again, in two biological replicates at the same time as he was doing degradation. So now we have four traces here in green are the abundance traces. Uh, we can layer them on top of, of, of this. Um, so again, really nice reproducibility. Um, these are the degradation hotspots you saw. This is what we're getting for, for abundance hotspots. And you're seeing this really, really nice uh, correspondence, right? It's not perfect. There's sort of some some degradation or, um, or abundance specific loci as well. But overall, it really looks like the degradation loci have a lot to do with the uh, abundance loci. So this is, this is uh, across hotspots. We can look um, locus by locus. Um, so this is what you already saw. We're now gonna layer on the individual abundance loci. If the circle stays empty, there is not overlap. If there's overlap, it's gonna get colored in. We are too strict in how we currently define overlap. Uh, this was done not long ago, this analysis, and there's still, still ways to do here. Uh, 
to to make it to make it better, I should say. But even with being too strict in how overlap is being defined, we're seeing that about a quarter of the abundance laws I do overlap a degradation locus. Um, I'm going to close by just walking you through. Uh, a few examples of what these relationships then 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 look like. I'm going to start with this one. Uh, this protein here has a, an abundance effect, but no degradation effect at all. Uh, Malon identified what this is experimentally before he before he left the lab. So this is due to a deletion in the promoter of this protein. So what this is is presumably a trans a, trans a, tra a, tra <laughs> a transcriptional <laughs> effect. Uh, that alters the mRNA abundance and then the protein abundance, but doesn't doesn't do anything to the degradation of this protein. Um, this is a case where we have a transacting effect uh, on both degradation and abundance. And the way this is polarized is such that when these loci point the same direction, this is what we call a concordant, or you can call it expected effect, where what we mean by that is more degradation goes with less abundance. Right, as one might think, you would degrade more the thing, you have less of the thing. Um, but there's also quite a few loci that, that do look like this, where it's the opposite or, or unexpected direction, if you want, where more degradation actually goes with more abundance. So these are, the, the, these are puzzling to us. I'm, I'm not going to pretend that it's um, any other way. Um, our current best thinking about this is that maybe this is some kind of buffering where the primary effect actually changes the abundance and then the cell sort of tries to, um, and uh, I think uh, we, were, we were admonished earlier to not enter anthropomorphize, and I'll try to not to, but maybe the cell tries to sort of counter this abundance difference uh, by alter degradation, but then ultimately fails because we still do see an abundance difference, right? So it's not, it's not perfect buffering. Um, so uh, these exist, they're actually not rare. If we just look at all the loci and sort of correlate their abundance and degradation effects, um, and do this within each replicate or in both replicates, this uh, correlation coefficient is always negative. It's not always significant, depends how exactly you do it, but it's certainly always negative, suggesting that there's actually quite a bit of this, of this buffering going on. Okay, so that was my last data slide. Um, this is a summary of, of our recent unpublished work that, that Melon then did, uh, where we found that the degradation of individual proteins, which really hasn't been looked at in, in any system from, from through this lens of genetic variation, is shaped by multiple transacting loci at both um, these core UPS genes and at these large pleiotropic regulators and may, con may play roles in um, influencing uh, protein abundance variation. So I'll stop. This is, uh, this is uh, the lab after Malon had already moved. Um, and uh, this is a summary of everything I told you. And uh, with that, I'm going to stop. And maybe there's time for questions. Sorry, I went long. Do we have questions? I, that was a really, really cool talk. Um, I, one thing that I guess we've been or we've been thinking a lot and wondering about recently is um, just specifically, I guess, like the mechanism exactly of how a lot of proteins are degraded are not totally sussed out. I mean, there's a lot of like interesting anecdotes, but it doesn't seem like we have a really comprehensive knowledge. I mean, is it certainly ubiquitination? Is, is that a specific recognition or is it independent? Um, I just wondered if you could talk a bit more about those core UPS genes and maybe what proteins those were and if that could lend any insight into, into this. Yeah, I mean, I should I should probably hand this one over to me. Uh, I'll, I'll try, and then you can see if you want to. Uh, so, I mean, it's a great point, right? I mean, it, it really seems to me, at least, that just like there's a transcriptional regulation code and maybe a translation code, there's also protein degradation code that that I that I certainly I do not understand, right? Um, and there's so things like the NN rule that that are worked out through carefully constructed reporters to sort of tease it out. And that was actually Maynard's published papers were sort of going through that and in, in, in great detail how there's pathway specificity and how genetic variation pulls at um, pulls at these things. Um, and one analysis we really, really want to do, but haven't done yet, is is to uh, I'm not going to click through all the way, but to look at these 49 proteins and see if sort of can we tease out which proteins are affected by a certain core UPS loci and which aren't, and 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 maybe sort of extract some information from there. We'll have to see. Then it's it's only 49 proteins, so it, you know 
you're you're a little constrained, but 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 there's a but there's certainly things we we can do. Um, about the core UPS genes, I mean, uh, I don't didn't put the the actual results here, but I mean the the cool thing is that that uh, there really was a lot of well, I mean, first of all, there's a lot of variation core UPS genes, which I don't know that we expected that way. I mean, so the pleiotropic regulators, you you tend to always get those. So I guess that was that was more expected, but but that we had you know, at final count, five genes that are really so they are the UPS, right? Um, and yet they carry variation that changes their function and usually multiple causal variants, actually. Um, and so these, for example, are three, uh, the, I, th I think the two E3 ligases in yeast, and they are the main differentiators of the two branches of the UPS. And there's this beautiful pathway specificity in terms of the NN rule reporters that, that, that map to them. Um, so, so yeah, you know, and then obviously analysis. What what is the first N-terminal amino acid of these proteins, and is, is that what what you know tends to go to these things? Whereas most of the signal we are getting from individual proteins actually goes to this guy here, right? Which is I, I think slightly less pathway specific, um, and we're actually also getting signal here at this proteasome component. So, so sorry, I'm sort of I'm, I'm rambling because we haven't done the analysis. But <laughs> yeah, thanks very much. That was really helpful. Thanks. Beautiful work. Uh, I'm, I'm really interested in pushing the interpretation of what you're finding further and in general. So my question is more conceptual. The identification of genetic associations with, with either phenotypes or RNA abundance has been quite successful, but the interpretation has been much more challenging. And intuitively to me, it seems that identifying associations with protein abundance and protein degradation should be very helpful for those interpretations. But I wonder if you can speak more specifically about approaches that can further that interpretation beyond my vague intuition that certainly should be helpful. Proteins are much more proximal to function. Do you have a more concrete vision of how do we turn those additional associations? Let's say we do this at very large scale. Let's say we do them also with protein synthesis. How do they move us closer to mechanistic interpretations? Yeah, I mean, this 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 is a this is a great question, and I'm, I think I'm going to sort of split the answer. I'm going to start with yeast and then speculate about humans. I mean, in, in yeast, it seems we have. Okay, so in yeast we can do crosses, and like we've done here, and there you can put a lot of genetic detection power behind whatever is in this cross, right? Obviously, what whatever is not in this cross you don't see, um, but but you do get, you never quite get to completeness, but but you do get to fill out a lot of the heritability that's in this cross, and and there I think it's. It's it's not crazy to think that you can sort of tease your way from this locus does this to this thing, does that to that thing, does this to that thing. And that's why growth is different, which in turn then goes back and changes the expression of all these genes. Um, because you, you can do time series where you put in the engineered alleles and sort of turn them on and watch the effects unfold. So this is where I think we're, we're sort of heading in yeast. Um, in, in humans, I, I honestly want to say I... I was at an NH NHGRI workshop a few months ago, and it seems sort of the, the prevailing view of the sort of annotating these GWAS variants is really an all of the above approach. Uh, there may and probably isn't sort of the one silver bullet that helps you make sense of all of them. Um, a, big, a big feature there is context specificity, cell type specificity, uh, tissue specificity, which is a way of saying cell types, but also developmental. Um, uh, trajectories and states. Uh, there is a lot of overlap between GWAS hits and um, genetic associations with RNA abundance. So there's enrichment, but it's but people are disappointed with how little of it there is. Uh, so it's sort of we have these associations for RNA, but maybe the wrong ones. And now, of course, maybe there's this protein effects, but maybe also it's just the cells aren't stimulated the right way that actually matters for that disease. So so there's sort of work pushing in that direction. More specifically about the, let, let's stick with protein abundance before we go to get into synthesis and degradation. I mean, there's there's efforts that, that are doing large scale mass spectrometry now on things like plasma proteins, where the search space is much smaller, it's just fewer proteins. 
and you can get the tissue from a lot of people, which is a limitation. Um, so that that I think is now up to, like I said, thousands of of individuals, and and interesting things come out. Um, you know, it seems there's more trans signal than cis signal at the RNA, probably because of secretion and things like that. So. Um, but again, I'm rambling, and I do think that is reflective of the field in the sense there isn't sort of the one thing that if we just do that, it's all going to make sense. And I think it is going to be sort of a big pileup of stuff and and then just, you know, seeing what every every GWAS locus might be different from every other, which is a bit terrifying to sort of genomics people like me, where it sort of likes to see patterns and they all make sense. But what if everything really is its own little snowflake, right, that we have to understand this way? And maybe that's just how it is. Thank you.